we're recording. Okay, a little more awake now. Uh, got a little sleep after returning back from Spice World 2016. This is the second of two videos going over the Spice World session that I presented on this week. Uh, there should be a link in the comments below or in the description below to the previous video. Um, so if you haven't watched that, that'll give a little more of a uh, previously on a uh, little preview kind of thing of what is to come into this video. Basically what the purpose of this section is, we're going to go over a uh, scenario that our IT manager has given us in order to build a PowerShell task. Let me just go back a few slides over here in this uh, presentation. Let's see here. There we go. Go back, 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 back. Okay. So our scenario here is that we uh, have a, a situation where our IT manager is getting an account lockout. I'm going to go over this real quickly. In the middle of the night, our network's account lockout examiner tool has given us some reports saying that something is getting locked out, gives us a computer name. And then our manager says, hey, I want to have all the um, event log items that start X minutes before and X minutes after the specific time of the event, just so I can get some idea of maybe cause of correlation, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> The level of need in this, in this case is that uh, this has happened before, so um, as a result I've copied a bit of PowerShell code from the internet, uh, like most people who, um, who do, if they're not terribly familiar with PowerShell, they'll just grab that one bit of code, they will run the bit of code to fix the issue, and then they just kind of shuffle it off somewhere or they delete it entirely. Um, I do want to show something at the tail end of this presentation to just show how I stash my PowerShell script commands and things like that for use later. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. There's no right or wrong way. It's just the way that I like to do it. Anyway, so the um, level of need here is that the IT manager has determined that this happens enough that he would like some sort of tool to be produced. He'd like his junior staff to check out the event logs, and then he'd like to have some sort of consistent method returning that data so that uh, the junior admin or the IT manager can look at the information. So the underlying, the underlined uh, comments here, junior staff and um, consistent, those two things pretty much warrant having some sort of script or some sort of method in which to uh, produce some sort of consistent, um, unalterable kind of method of getting that information. And that's where the tool comes from. The output that the IT manager would like is some sort of formatable, some sort of sortable, viewable way of looking at all the event logs from the system log in order to see, you know, if there's anything happening before or after the event of interest. And um, I don't mention it here, but in some prior slides on the other presentation, I said, well, maybe as a bonus, we could look at all the event logs on the system, not just the system event log and there is quite a difference in the amount of results that you're going to get because system event log obviously is one event log which is fairly busy on a system uh, but if you were to search all the event logs I mean we're talking hundreds of them so you'll see in a minute what that looks like and as far as the input goes this is uh, helping us decide what our output is going to be we need the date and time of the event we're interested in and we need the range of minutes I'm not terribly concerned about getting you know five minutes before, three minutes after. I'm just going to get five minutes, five minutes, three minutes, three minutes. I'm just going to make a even window of time before and after the event of interest. So uh, pretty much obvious here to use these parameters. Our script needs to do these things. Find system event logs, X amount of minutes before and after the event of interest. And then we're going to provide the output, uh, the outputted objects to the user, which is, that's easy to do. That's what, just what PowerShell does. Oh, here's the slide. <laughs> Sorry. So can we get these items from all event logs? That's our bonus. And now we're going to code. All right, I'm going to Alt-Tab over to the PowerShell ISE. So if you're not familiar with this, check out the other presentation I did or any number of other presentations on YouTube or whatever that go over the PowerShell ISE. This is the built-in scripting environment that Microsoft provides to you when you install PowerShell. And it's an excellent tool. It does uh, pretty much everything I need it to do. I mean, some really heavy-duty, hardcore PowerShellers will use things like Sapien, PowerShell Suite, and all that stuff. But um, I'm pretty happy at this time with um, the ISE. 
All right, so let's get started. We're going to talk about our inputs. What are we going to give to our script in order for it to produce the output that we're looking for? Well, there are two things that we know that we need to give it, and that is date. This is a variable. We need to give it a range of time or a range of minutes. So two variables, PowerShell sees these. These are basic null variables. There's nothing specifically that separates the two of these. They're the same thing. Let's give it some information. Okay, I know that I have some event log entries for 10.31.2016 at uh, 12 minutes, seconds, p.m., like that. And for our range, we're going to give it a range of, we're going to give it a wider range than I usually give. We'll give it a range of 20 minutes before and after. Now, by looking at these two variables, they are essentially the same in that the date and range are not specifically set to be time and integer variables. But, I mean, you might say, yeah, well, there's data here that tells us that there's a date in one and, a, and an integer in another. But... To PowerShell, it's, those are just two basic variables. Now, it will try to take what's in the date variable and try to apply a date time format to it, which allows you to do certain things with it that you can't do with other types of uh, variable types. But being that we're in total control of our script here, I'm going to give it a date time data type so that when the script is processing this information, it knows it's a date time Let's do date time calculations against it. Um, let's get specific information about it that relates to date time objects. Um, that way we force the script to use that variable for what it is, date time object. Now likewise, we can do the same thing with range. Now there are obviously data types that are predefined here that Microsoft would allow you to use. So I would suggest going out to the internet, looking up um, all the different types of data types, and you'll see date time is one, integer is another, boolean is another, switch, IP address, that's a good one, string, obviously, array, things like that. Okay, so next, let's create our uh, script processing section. Now, being that this is a basic PowerShell tool, I'm not doing the whole thing where there's uh, a begin process and end section of the script. This is something that kind of falls into more of an advanced or intermediate uh, concept. So this is a basic way of doing it, but once you get into that more advanced way of doing things, you can start to do some really cool stuff like doing a pipeline input into your script, output objects from another commandlet, and bring them into your script and use them. So keep that in mind. All right, <clears throat> so we have our script processing section. What are we gonna put here? Well, I have that little bit of code that um, I used last time that we had this particular problem come up. I'm going to copy this, paste this here. And so I've got my git dash win event filter hash table. And you see that we have a little bit of a little hash table here at log name. That's a key system. That's a value, but that's the name of the log that we're looking for. And then we have this start time. And then we have a static set time and date here uh, that will run. Now, given this information, we could just simply put our cursor on this line, and we can hit F8 on our keyboard, and it will run that one line of code. So there are a few entries there. And knowing that there's some data there, actually, let me, let me grab this date time and take this out. I'm gonna paste it up here, okay. And what we're going to do now is we're going to make this command a little more dynamic. We're going to have it actually use the date from that line right there. Uh, so let's use dollar sign date like that. It's kind of cool to have a little video window and I can point to things. That's pretty awesome. All right. <clears throat> so now we have get dash win event filter hash table. This is the way that we're filtering the information um, for the events. And then we have our start time set up here to use the date variable we specified above. So now it's going to search for events that start on 1029 2016 at 12 p.m. So in order to do this, now we don't run this one line of code. Now we run the whole script. We can hit F5 on our keyboard and we get that same information returned back to us, which is great. This is working just the way we want it to. 
So now the next thing we need to do is figure out how do we create this range of time? How do we get it to calculate 20 minutes before and 20 minutes after the event of interest? Well, let's take first a look at the date object. So we, here, let's uh, clear that. We're gonna type in date like this. We hit enter, we get our date time that we specified above up here. And let's do this. Let's use our get member commandlet. Now, if you watch the other video, you know that get member will get properties and methods about objects that are pushed to it or, or piped through the pipeline to that commandlet. And like we said, all objects have properties and attributes and methods, or I'm sorry, properties and methods. So this get member will find these things about it and tell you what they are. So if I hit enter here, it'll give us a list of things about the date time object and what we can do with it. A variety of methods, a variety of actions that we can commit here against that date time object and a variety of properties. Interesting thing here, we could do date um, day of week. And that day of the week is Saturday. Or month, month 10, which is October which is good. So that means we can also do the same thing with the methods. We can add minutes to our date. And as I hit tab there, you'll see that it automatically created that parentheses for us. So we can type in uh, a minute value to our existing date, which now brings it to 12.30 p.m. This is exactly what we want. We want to add some information to that to create our date range. So let's do this up here. And I see that my face is going to get in the way, which it usually does. <laughs> the story of my life. All right, so add minutes tab. We're going to do a negative range here. So that means we're going to subtract the amount of time that we specified up here from this time. Now, you might be asking yourself, why is there not a subtract minutes and a subtract days and subtract milliseconds and all that stuff? There, there's not. They figured that you you can just easily just use the add minutes or add methods and just put a negative calculation in there, and that's exactly what they did. There's really no reason to create a whole second set of these things when you can just simply add a negative or a minus sign there. Okay, so let's say I'm just a beginning a PowerShell guy, which probably did most seasoned guys I am, but that's okay. I don't mind being uh, called out. Um, but uh, if you look at the filter hash table and you go out on the internet and you look for this information, um, as far as what the hash table supports, you'll see that log name is one, start time is another. There's about 13 other ones. Um, but I do know that end time is another one. And unlike all the uh, the crazy, uh, <laughs> crazy religious guys who uh, claim there's an end time. We actually do have an end time here. We're going to do date, add minutes, and then we're going to actually use a positive range like this. So now we've created a range of time. We've created our 12 p.m. Uh, and then minus the 20 minutes, and it's um, going to be 11.40 a.m. and then here to be 12.20 p.m. So, so far we have a really useful tool to get event logs uh, with a window of time specified. The only difference here is that right now we have static values set up here. There's no way for us at this time to input particular values and we'll get to that in just a second. Those are called parameters. But let's go ahead and run this script as it is and see what kind of data it returns. All right. so. With our 10-29-2016, 12pm, there's only one event that shows up here. Uh, system event is pretty busy, but when you're not on your system, I suspect it's not quite as busy. And I was at, I was at work that day. <laughs> um, so in a few minutes here, we're actually going to check all the event logs, and you'll see a lot more information being returned to us. But we do know that this works because we see that we have this 12pm. Let's see if we can widen this berth out a little bit here. Let's give it a, quite a bit of time, like a real wide berth of 70 minutes, so a total of 140 minutes. Hit F5 again, and a couple events occurred. Great. This looks pretty good. Okay, so let's reduce this back down to 20. Now, we need to take this information here, and um, let's convert these variables into parameters while we're thinking about it. So that's pretty easy to do, to do in PowerShell, really. There's a 
you just do P-A-R-M, I'm sorry, P-A-R, I don't spell very well, apparently. <laughs> P-A-R-A-M, open parentheses, tab these guys in. This is part of your formatting. And you'll see that we got a little squiggly here, here and here. And this says it's missing a parentheses. Well, I mean, it's there, but actually what it's really missing, and this is where PowerShell could probably be a little bit better at giving you an error, but it's the context of the error that's the issue here. It's not so much the fact that it knows that there's an error. I mean, what it sees here is that we have a couple things, and according to PowerShell, this is all one entity. I mean, it, there's nothing separating it. So we have to create, uh, put, place a comma here to separate these two parameters from each other so that it knows it's got two parameters to use. So you notice the squiggly went away, and um, I'm going to save my script here. Let's see, is that, yes, that's in the folder, I think it is, okay. So we hit save, and now down below, and you also notice I'm using this dot slash format. I've got a lot of these scripts available to me. Um, I use this dot slash format. This is basically just using like a, a directory locator so that it knows where I'm trying to run the script from. This also accomplishes another goal, which is to kind of prevent you from accidentally running um, malicious scripts that might be in the same folder as, you know, maybe maybe someone has written a malicious script called get service dot ps1 and you're trying to run get dash service well get dash service is just going to execute uh, if you just type it in whereas if you wanted to run the script you actually have to type in purposefully the dot slash naming convention which is it's kind of a neat little easy way to kind of help protect yourself a little bit okay so now at the bottom we've we've typed in our get event range dot ps1 <clears throat> get myself out of the way here so we can see what's happening and I can hit dash now and look, I've got two parameters here specified that I can uh, set myself. So you look over to the right here, you see that it says date, it says date time. That's the object type or the data type that you see specified up here. So that's good. So as a guy running this script, I know that I need to enter in some sort of date time value here. Which I'll go ahead and do. 10, uh, let's see, what's a day? Let's see, 31st was Monday. Let's say uh, Sunday at 9 p.m. Let's see here, 10.30, 2016, 9 p.m. Okay, I'll switch up my range a little bit. And uh, we're gonna say, we're gonna say 30 minutes. And this is going to check the system log for all events that occurred at 9 p.m. or actually 30 minutes prior to 9 p.m. and 30 minutes after. Not a lot. I don't have a very busy system apparently. Look at that, it's trying to do name resolution for gecko.spiceworks.com. Okay, so we do know this works the way we want it to work. Um, I, I would have liked it to create more information, but anytime you get onto a live system uh, without like uh, pre-staged information, it's a little difficult to get everything that you're looking for. So let's go and put in some help. Now we talked briefly about get-help in the first video of this pre uh, series. And this is kind of what it looks like. You do a get help, and you can type in whatever commandlet that you want. And we'll do a show window here. Now, if you're trying to run this on a Windows 7 system, you're trying to run get dash help and then your topic, and then you type in show window, it's probably, not probably, it's, it's possible that it won't work unless you've gone out and you've upgraded your PowerShell to version three or above. So if show window doesn't show up for you, just, just take, uh, take out dash show window and just do the get help, um, get service, and you'll see a similar bit of content, but in the console below. So this is what show window is like, and this is like a huge reason why I like uh, PowerShell 3 was just simply for this reason only, is that you have everything in this nice searchable window. You can select whether or not you want to look at, you know, this uh, synopsis uh, description, and you want to look maybe just at examples. Um, and you can uh, adjust your search op options here, but you can zoom in if your heart of uh, your, your site is not so good, or you can zoom out if you're I got really great eyes, I guess, and a high resolution monitor. Uh, but anyway, so you can go through this, and you see there's all sorts of information about it, like the parameter types, some notes, some examples. Um, 
a description, you know, all sorts of stuff. So where does this come from? Well, this is called comment-based help, and this can be added to your script or functions uh, quite easily. Now, I happen to have in my script that I keep not clicking on first for whatever reason, and let's see if I can find it here. Here we go. It's always good to have staged stuff in this case, though. So we have to place that at the top of the script or function. So another thing to note here is that scripts and functions like to have things in a particular order. So in the case of your, um, your metadata here for the comment-based help, they like to have that at the top. And then the next immediate item can be um, your parameter block. But certainly if you're using something called uh, commandlet binding, that has to be after your comment-based help and above your parameter section. Com commandlet binding, uh, by the way, is something that you'll start getting into in, in more intermediate scripting, is, and it allows you to use things like uh, uh, verbose command line switches, or uh, parameters, I mean, and uh, debug, and what if. Um, so if you have any kind of like those, like let's modify the system commandlets, using what if is really handy. I can just leave this in here. It's not going to hurt anything. So here I'm going to save the file. And then I'm going to do a get help, and we're going to refer to our get event range PS1 show window. And look, we have our help file right here. This is the information that maybe uh, you give the script to somebody, or this somebody inherits this script years from now, and they can run the get help against it, and there's all sorts of information here for them to look at that helps them run the script in the way that it was intended. So get help is I mean, so useful. I mean, you can document your code as well, like what I've done here, um, all with the hash there. Um, and again, so with this this little hash caret, that's how you can come out, comment out an entire section. So if you've got some code that you're still working on, you don't want it to execute just yet, you can put those... Um, little blocks uh, in your code and document entire sections of code or, or lines of comments. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too was functions. If you decide to get into building functions, and those are kind of like little containerized bits of code that are referred to often within your script, just remember that you need to place the function somewhere before the code that actually calls the function. So get stuff, you know, if you're having this thing do something like uh, like this, um, you're not going to be able to call it up here, even though the tab completion worked for me. But if you're executing the script, get stuff isn't loaded in memory yet when it runs through this code. So you actually have to put that down here somewhere. Just keep that in mind. So there are certain orders in which all this stuff can be placed within your script. It's important to remember. All right, so we've saved this file. We've got our help. Oh, here, let's take out get stuff. And really, at this point, we could hand this script off to our IT manager. But let's take a look at the output real quick before we get too far. Actually, we'll just scroll up here. OK, so the output right now is in this. Um, this uh, just basic text format, which is okay. But maybe the uh, IT manager, well, he did say he wanted it in a way that he could sort this stuff. So if we use our grid view instead, this is a different output commandlet. There's a whole slew of them that are available to you. You'll see that we can actually get this in a browsable, filterable uh, view where you can select columns to, um, to show and hide. Um, and you can start doing some filtering at the top here. Uh, we have here, we have time created, we have ID, we have level display name showing like warning, error, informational, that kind of thing. We have the message column, which has the information for the event entry in particular. So this is good. Um, for the most part, this could probably serve our purposes. However, if we decide to expand this out a little bit and get more event logs, uh, maybe we want to show a column that says log name so that when we import this into Excel, we know which log these event log items come from. So let's close this out. We're going to use our old friend, get member again. 
And actually, we're going to do this. We're going to do get member. We're going to outgrid view this thing as well. Oops. If I can type it, that would be great. And so we have a list here of <coughs> all the members and properties, which we can sort for our uh, get event range script. So this script here running has outputted itself all of its properties and methods to um, this grid view. <clears throat> so let's do this. We're going to filter on member type contains property. So we're going to look at all the different properties that are available to us. And we see we have a, I'm going to sort by name here because I like it by name. We have ID which was returned to us before. We have the level display name, which was returned to us before. That was that error warning informational thing. We have um, message, which was the information contained therein, and then we had time created. Well, we actually need also log name. So let's go ahead and add all these. Now here's the thing. So when you run the, the script, you're gonna get the four columns by default. I'm not sure why it picks those specific four but we have to, when we want to add additional columns, we have to either use an asterisk or uh, we can specify them um, by separating them out with commas. You can't just simply add, you know, um, some command lets let you do this, but uh, this, com this script does not. But um, you can't just specify one additional column here. So we have to do it for all of them. So we have to do select object, kind of like SQL again. And we can do ID time created, uh, log, what's it, level display name. I can't remember this. Um, log name and message. Let's see if I'm right. Out grid. I'm going to zoom back out a little bit here. Okay, so now we actually have the log name. We have our ID, we have our time created, we have our display name of warning, we have the system uh, log name, and then we have the actual message for the, uh, the event entry. All right, so we had some extra credit here. Now this is good, we've, we've done what we need to do here. We provided the output that the IT manager wanted, we can share the script with him, he can save it on his system, run it locally, whatever. Um, <clears throat> Let's do the little bonus assignment, which was how do we get all the event logs from all the systems, or I'm sorry, all the events from all the event logs on the system. Got my words mixed up. So there are another couple things we need to do here. We need to first uh, get all event logs from the system, place them into a variable. <clears throat> Oops, we actually need to do this below the parameter block. <clears throat> and then we need to loop through all event logs in the variable and get the items of interest. Okay, so in order to get all the event logs from the system, we just need log name because you see down here we have log name in our hash table. So if we can just get this value, we should be able to get all the event logs from all the event log um, sources on the system. So how do we do that? Well, get when event, which we use above here, also has this cool thing called list log as a parameter. And if we hit star, actually let's outgrid this as well because it's a little easier to view. We have a lot, a lot, you see it's still going, of event logs. Here's the name. And you see the usual classics like application and security and system. But look at all these. I mean, there are a ton of them. And you know, like there's ones for group policy. Uh, there's some for PowerShell. There are some for, let's see, do I have Azure on here? Yep, I got some Azure stuff on here. Tons of stuff. So asking a junior level ad admin to go through all these event logs and look for items of interest is downright uh, uh, mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, I guess if you don't like the guy, maybe that's, uh, <laughs> that's what you have him do, I suppose. So anyway, how do, we, how do we get all this information? Well, like I said, we have log name, right? So that's a column. Okay. So we should be able to do this then. Like this. And this is the information we're looking for. We just need these values. We're going to take off out grid view, but we're going to take the rest of this. And I'm going to create a new variable and we're going to call it log. And we're going to take all those log names and we're going to place them into, uh, actually, let's, let's name this more appropriately, log names. So we're going to take all those log names and place them into a variable called log names. Log names is an object which contains multiple items that we can work with. So the next thing is we need to figure out how do we iterate through each of those items, each of those log names, and possibly do something with them. Well, we can use the for each construct. Now, there is a different way. Someone probably who's a little more advanced might say, hey, well, can't you just take this information and pipe it back into get when event and get the information? The answer is yes, you can. It's just that when um, I like when I write scripts for myself after I forget, <laughs> and if I'm trying to give these scripts to somebody else who maybe doesn't have a lot of experience with PowerShell, sometimes cranking everything into a variable is a little more um, easy to grasp than the piping. So it's just a matter of scripting style here at this point. But like I said, I like to break things out a little bit to make it a little easier to follow for other folks. So anyway, let's go back to our for each construct here. For each requires that you tell PowerShell um, that I want to go through an array of items. But we have to call each thing that we're going through a name so that it knows what to work with. This is if we're using the for each outside of the pipeline, is which we're, what we're doing right now. So we do log, we just call it log. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it Fred or, or uh, you know, uh, wall or whatever you want to call it. But we're going to call it log. I'm going to say for every log in log names, we're going to execute a little bit of code. Now, technically, we're going to use this code. And you notice that I'm tabbing in again. Formatting is, is great. If you want help from other people, always format your code. You may be shitty at coding, which some people probably would say that I might be, but um, at least if you format it, it's a polished turd, right? Okay, so I'm sorry for the language for those of you who are sensitive to that. Anyway, so let's remark this out for, for the moment. We want to guarantee that we're actually going through each item in our loop. Now, also, write host here. What I'm doing here is I'm going to write some information to the screen. Write host is probably not something that you're going to want to use in the future a lot. Write host is nice in one way in that um, it actually produces information to the screen, but it doesn't provide anything to the output of objects, for example. So in some ways, I like that because then it's not tainting my actual uh, outputted object stream. But there are people who will say that it kills puppies, and I would say use write host very, very, uh, in a very limited fashion. Okay, so we're going to say processing. We're just going to say log here. All right, so what you're going to see here is probably not exactly what you're expecting if you're not familiar with hash tables. So let's go ahead and run our script again. It's going to gather all the log names. It's going to go through each log name and show us what's in the object being returned for each line. Now, notice that I did not mention column of data, but actually the object. And here we go. You see that we have the word processing, like what we've written here. But now there's this other hash table here. It says at curly brace log name equals, and it shows the name of the log. Um, that's good. So each object has multiple columns associated with it, but in this case there's only one column, but it is a named column num nonetheless, and it's called log name. So in order for us to get the specific log name, we, we can do this. And I'm going to remark this out just to kind of get around the fact that I'm going to have to talk to you about sub-expressions, but anyway, we can just do this. We can go log 
dot. And now that object is loaded in memory, so we have some things available to us, and log name is one of those things that we can pick up here. That's a property. If I hit F5 again, we should now see that it'll say processing and then the log name, but not all this other hash table information. And there you go. So you can tell already that this kind of information down here is essentially the same as what we would need to enter here. Okay, so let's take that out. We're gonna take out the comment for win, get win event. And I'm going to take out the static value of system and replace that with dollar sign log dot log name. So at some point through the, for each log process, the word system will appear in here and it will return all events in the system event log. Let's save this. We're gonna rerun this. Let's see here, that's what we want. That's the one we ran earlier, which was get event range, give it the date, give it the range. And if you remember, it only gave us like one event or two events from the system event log. We'll hit enter and we should start seeing there we go, lots and lots of things. I don't even know what radar pre-leak is. That doesn't sound good. Oh, free make, don't make fun of me guys. But you see there's a whole slew of events here now. It's given us the log name, it's give, given us the time created and all the other information that we need. And you notice in the background, we had a lot of red text going by. It's okay, get one event actually will give you an error if no events fall within the filtered criteria. Uh, you can suppress this by going to the end of your get when event and doing a uh, error uh, action and silently continue. If you start getting into uh, doing try catch loops, that's where you start getting to some inter inter intermediate uh, script writing tool making. Try catch will try a bit of command and uh, or commandlet or code or whatever, and if there's an error, you would say error action stop on the commandlet in question, and then in your catch. Uh, section of code, you would actually do something different. Maybe it's, you know, update a status or run some other section of code, etc. Uh, that's what that does. We're going to save this again. And then we're going to rerun this one more time with the parameters. And you'll notice now that we're not getting a ton of uh, red showing up below. I mean, this is all from the prior command, but but there you go. So now I can just copy all that if I wanted to um, into, uh, I'm looking over my microphone. Just like that, we can paste it into Excel if we want. We can actually change the output entirely. We, instead of using out grid view, we could use um, <clears throat> out file, if I can type right, get off the home keys here. File path, um, we can specify C temp, um, file.txt and it'll do the same thing. I'll give it a moment to complete. Okay. Yeah, sure, let's open it Notepad plus plus. You guys know I like it. I'm not trying to dig on. But here it is. Here's boop, boop. that's all. I'm <laughs> scrolling too fast for the screen. But that's all the information that was oops. Oh boy. I didn't want to get that. Alrighty. So up, down, up, down. Oh, that's page up, down. I don't want our control page up, down. That's not what I want. Anyway, so th this is all the information that we got from those event logs. So good deal. Good deal. I'll just blur that other stuff out in post editing. Okay. There you go. Uh, that is a tool that we have created with PowerShell. This script is actually quite powerful in that we can specify a date. Actually, let's take our static date out real quick. And we'll just do this. We're gonna do get date add minutes negative 60. So now, oops. Now the script will check. If you don't specify any parameters, it will check an hour ago with a date or a time range of 20 minutes before and 20 minutes after. So just so that we make this just a little more dynamic.
Okay, so here's our tool. We can share this with other people, um, and this should do what they want. That was part of the requirements. Let's go back to our PowerPoint real quick and finish up. All right, so best practices. Um, Comment-based help, use it. Uh, if you're sharing your scripts or if you're uh, saving them for later on and you write it now and then you, know, you don't deal with PowerShell in four or five months, you can use your help to basically keep you informed as to what that script is for. Format your script. If you're a terrible uh, scripter, at least tab your stuff, uh, especially when you're doing like nested loops. Um, there is kind of a current movement right now to get out of nesting your code so much and I believe they'll use things like break or continue uh, etc to um, or return to get out of those loops so keep that in mind as you're looking on the internet for uh, examples of nested loops some people might tell you that that's kind of what we're getting away from um, nothing really wrong with it it's just a again a matter of preference make your scripts and functions single purpose and name them accordingly like I said don't have a script called um, you know get SQL services and at the tail end of it um, remove or install something so make it make it useful for that one thing that you've named it when you do name your scripts or functions, try to use Microsoft supported verbs to, to do it. Uh, you can get a list of these verbs from uh, PowerShell just by typing in get dash verb, hit enter, and you'll see a whole list of them. Actually, let me show you real quick. Do an outgrid view again. I don't like doing the aliases. Um, there's a way that you can kind of shorthand this a little bit, but I like to use the full command so people know what we're running exactly. Okay, these are the supported verbs. And you can see that they, they have different uh, groups associated with them. So I guess so if your action is falling under one of these types of groups, just kind of keep it in mind um, that these are the types of verbs that they want you to use for that kind of action. Oh, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go back, go back, there we go, sorry. That's the part, the problem of going between uh, your code window and back into PowerPoint. Anyway, so uh, last thing here I wanted to mention, um, when you execute .ps1 files, make sure that you configure your execution policy on the system. By default, uh, it'll probably not let you run it, and it'll tell you. PowerShell likes to tell you when things go wrong, but it's actually pretty informative as to the reasons why it does that. So for example, here we've got set execution policy, dash, and I'm sorry for the line break there, dash execution policy, remote sign, so that allows remote scripts on your network to be executed but only if they're signed with a code signing certificate um, but you can copy the script to your own system and run them from there if you like there are other ones like bypass uh, which will bypass the execution policy altogether um, this is not really a security measure just so you know this is just more of a way to control um, accidental code edits and things like that um, so I'll give you a quick example. In my environment, we have a PKI, a private key infrastructure, and we have a, uh, a CA built in on our one of our servers to sign whatever, it hands out certificates. So I've got it handing me out a uh, code signing certificate, and then I sign my scripts with that code signing certificate. And then under my domain, I set up my execution policy to remote signed. All that really uh, does, oh, and also you have to deploy that certificate out to your domain computers, which is easily done through group policy, by the way. But anyway, what that really accomplishes is basically I'm just saying that whatever scripts that I put together, um, at least the ones that I specify, um, I don't want it modified and then accidentally run without re-signing it again. It's just basically more of a like final sign-off, final check-off on the script. It's not really, like again, like a, a real security policy or anything like that. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so extra credit, share and enjoy. Make sure you save your files at .ps1. We actually did that in our demo. Share with your coworkers. Again, if you copy to a network share, make sure that it's signed or you've you know, set to, you set your host to bypass again, which I wouldn't totally recommend. Um, and then uh, create a module. That's another uh, cool uh, thing to dig into, and that's basically taking your script, converting it into a function. So basically, you wrap some function around it and uh, save it as a file and then that module loads automatically um, if you have PowerShell 3 and above when a person calls the function from within that module. Uh, pretty cool stuff that's in your uh, user profile by the way so 
see users, username, documents, Windows PowerShell, all one word, slash modules. If you create the Windows PowerShell folder, I mean, you have to do this manually, you then can create a, uh, the, like I said, the modules folder, and you can also create a PowerShell profile, which will load certain things up as you load up the ISE. Kind of cool. So if you're learning PowerShell for the first time, here are a few books, a couple books that you can look toward. Um, there's also a great link in the Spiceworks community, and of course anywhere else on the internet <laughs> for that matter. But um, uh, I'll have to see if I can f find the link, and I'll post it in the description. Um, but basically, these two books are really, really good. PowerShell in a Month of Lunches, Don Jones and Jeffrey Hicks. They also do PowerShell tool making, which a lot of the content in this uh, slide show and demo kind of is referenced in the book somewhere. Uh, PowerShell tool, make, tool making in a Month of Lunches, by, again, by Don Jones and Jeffrey Hicks. And then finally, um, PowerShell 3.0 Jumpstart. If you're not a reader, you like to follow along in, uh, on your laptop, maybe that's a little more your, your speed. Um, go with the Microsoft Virtual Academy. Jason Helmick and uh, Jeffrey Snover do a really great back and forth kind of session. It's very, um, very low key, very approachable, and they take you all the way from the beginning with opening up the console for the first time to actually installing the uh, PowerShell Web Access on a server. Yes, you can do that. So you can install PowerShell Web Access so you can open up your Android tablet and actually execute PowerShell against your servers. That is so cool. So cool. And again, anything by Jeffrey Snover. I mean, I mean, the dude invented it, right? So um, anything he's put together, video-wise, documentation-wise, etc. Good stuff. So this is the end of the demo portion of the uh, Spice World 2016 Basic PowerShell Toolmaking session. So I really appreciate you watching this. I hope you learned something from it. Again, I'm not the uh, top expert in PowerShell. I just happen to like to share what I have learned so that people can get into it. Um, so again, I'm not going to be the best coder in the world. There's lots of others in the, the Spiceworks community specifically, but just even PowerShell.org. Reddit has a great PowerShell um, subreddit as well. Check all those resources out. Don't be afraid to share your stuff. We're all here to help you. And I uh, hope to see you out there. So again, thanks a lot, guys, and we'll be seeing you around.